Welcome back to The Look and Sound of Leadership, an ongoing series of executive coaching tips designed to help you be perceived in the workplace the way you want to be perceived. I'm Tom Henschel, your executive coach, and today we're talking about psychological safety. Amit was telling me about an upcoming presentation. His boss, Regina, a member of the senior leadership team, had asked Amit to present the results of an initiative his team had been working on. Amit was preparing to do battle. He said, It's bad enough how Regina treats us during our own staff meetings. If she does something like that to me in front of the leadership team, it is going to be the last straw. What is it she does exactly, I asked. She makes you feel stupid. If you ask questions, she'll say the question's stupid. If you make a suggestion, she'll tell you it's stupid. It's like being back in school and having the teacher shame you in front of the whole class. I asked, do people even participate? I would think they'd be cowering. They are. We are. But I can't cower when I'm the presenter, and I've got this bad feeling that she's going to try and make herself look big in front of her peers by using me for target practice. Oh, a meat, I said. How can I help? I don't know. You have any tricks so I don't lose it if she does a number on me? After a quick flip through my metal files, I asked, do you know the phrase psychological safety? No, he said, but I love it. I've been trying to explain how I feel to my wife. She says it's just nerves, but it's not. I didn't know it until you said it, but the right word is safety. Working with Regina doesn't feel safe. That's it exactly. I said, Amit, Regina's been your boss a while already, hasn't she? Two years, he groaned. So tell me, how have you been keeping yourself safe so far? How do you mean, he asked. I said, imagine yourself at one of her staff meetings where she's calling everybody stupid. What do you do when it's your turn in the barrel? Oh, it's tough, he said. I keep telling myself two things all the time. One, we are all in this together. I am not alone in that room. I said, so Regina isn't doing this just to you. Oh, no. She does not discriminate. We are all targets. Remembering that helps me not take it personally. Look, you know, when it's my turn for a beating, it feels awful. But I know it's not about me. I try not to take any of her behavior personally, as hard as that is. Well, that's terrific, Amit. The other thing I tell myself, (sighs) I say this at night. Sometimes a particular exchange will play over and over in my head. And I remind myself, I am not a victim here. I have a lot of choice, including the choice to not even be in the room, right? I could quit. I could do a lot of things. Remembering that I have choice calms me down. I said, those are two great self-talk messages, Amit. You are not alone and you are not a victim. Wow, I couldn't have coached you any better than that. You know what's empowering, he asked. I'm documenting everything. I am not going to be surprised the day her behavior turns into an investigation, and I will have it all in writing. Making that choice helps me too. I bet it does, I said. He asked, is that psychological safety phrase something I should be thinking about with my own team? I'd hate to treat them the way Regina treats us. I said, I doubt you're in danger of that, Amit. But sure, yes, actively trying to create an environment that is psychologically safe, yeah, that's a great way to lead. So what should I know, he asked. I thought for a second and then said, the person who coined the term psychological safety is Amy Edmondson. She is at Harvard Business School now. When she was a young researcher... She was interested in what made some teams high-performing. She started observing teams in hospitals because it is really easy to find the high-performing teams in hospitals, right? She chose to measure the number of human errors a team makes in patient medication. And what she found was that the teams who were highest in psychological safety also made the most errors. What, he said? (laughs) That's not where I thought that was going. Neither did she, I said. So she kept up her research, and what she found was that the teams 
with the highest psychological safety weren't necessarily making more mistakes than the other teams. They were just talking about their mistakes more often than the other teams. Openly admitting mistakes and searching for better results were a core part of what those teams were doing every day. And they did it without blame. Openness was rewarded. Everyone had a voice. So the errors were front and center. That sounds like a book some surgeon wrote about how everyone in the operating room has to speak up, even the first-year resident. Oh, I said, The Checklist Manifesto. That's a great book, isn't it? Atul Gawande wrote that. I love him. Yes, that is a perfect example, Amit, of how Edmondson's psychological safety creates high performance. So what should I be doing with my team? Well, Edmondson had a really simple model. It's a helpful way to think about all this. There's an x-axis and a y-axis. Along the bottom, accountability. And up the side, psychological safety. And both of them can be ranked high or low, you know, so there are four quadrants. Both the x and y are high or low or mixed, whatever. Edmondson observed that some teams were low in accountability and also low in psychological safety. She called that the apathy zone. People are checked out. She saw other teams who were still low in accountability but high in psychological safety, and she called that the comfort zone. Everything feels pretty good up in the comfort zone. There might not be a lot getting done, but it feels good. And then there are teams that are high in accountability but low in psychological safety, and she called that the anxiety zone. Amit said, well, that's us with Regina, for sure. We get the work done, but it's like dancing in a minefield. I said, yes, this quadrant, the anxiety zone, this is where workplace trauma happens, Amit. This can be really toxic. He was silent for a moment, reflecting. And then he said, what's the fourth box where both factors are high? I said, she called that the learning zone. Teams in the learning zone strive to get better, to not assign blame. He said, I've always been stronger on the psychological safety side than the accountability side. I thought that if my team feels safe enough to tell me they've screwed up, then holding them accountable is a little like hitting them when they're down. I said, so accountability would end safety? Yeah, because a lot of the time when you tell someone they're not hitting the mark, they get pissed off or their feelings get hurt. That doesn't sound like safety, does it? That sounds like Regina. I said, I imagine accountability differently. I imagine that we are all in agreement about the goal we're working towards. And if we are all contributing to one score on the scoreboard, then I want you to hold me accountable. It's like I'm a player and you're the coach. Your feedback is going to make me better. And I'm going to see that as helpful because we all want to win the title. I can't be my best without feedback. That's accountability. He said, well, I like the idea of coaching. I used to coach Little League, and I always used to ask the kids, how do you think that went? What do you think we could do better? And did they have ideas, I asked? He laughed. Are you kidding? They had a million ideas. Getting them to speak up was not the problem. Well, it sounds like you made it safe for them, Amit. You see, you already know a lot about creating safety. He wondered... Would those same questions work with my team now? Why not, I said. How do you think that went, and what do you think we could do differently? Those are exactly the kinds of questions that help create safety. Then, with a little groan, he said, You know what this means, don't you? What, I asked. If we're reflecting honestly, I'm going to be on the chopping block myself sometimes. If we're really going to think about how to do things differently, then my actions have to be on the table. I mean, just like that surgeon's in that checklist book. Would that be so hard, I asked? Hard? Maybe not. Is it my natural instinct? No. I said, Amit, you asked how you can create safety for your team, and you just named two behaviors that Edmondson specifically calls out as effective. One, fallibility. You're right. You are going to need to admit your mistakes. She says leaders who want to create safety have to be willing to admit their mistakes. Number two, inviting feedback. They have to encourage genuine conversations that ask questions just like, how do you think that went? And how could this be better? 
thinking of something else, he said, would it be fair to say that to create safety, a boss has to be a good listener? Well, that's certainly part of it. Yeah, I agreed. Oh, it's been on my mind lately, he said. There have been a lot of articles in my feed saying that because of working remotely, bosses have to do a better job connecting with their people. We should ask how people are doing, listen to them talk about their personal lives. And I got to tell you, Tom, I am not sure I'm up for this. For years, I was told not to have personal conversations with my direct reports, and I didn't. And now suddenly I'm supposed to just flip and talk personally? What's your concern, I asked. Well, I just don't think I'm very good at those sorts of personal conversations. Is that something you and I could talk about in the coaching? I told him I would be happy to. That coaching conversation about making personal connections is next month's episode of The Look and Sound of Leadership. If you are in a workplace where the psychological safety is low, I am sorry. It is not a fun place to be. If it is really toxic, it can create serious stress in the nervous system. This is documented. I hope you know that. But most workplaces that are low in psychological safety don't get to that kind of toxic level. Nevertheless, they are not fun. And so I think you need to keep your wits about you. I want to give you two thoughts about surviving when safety is low. One is about protecting yourself. The other is about caring for yourself. And I see those as different. Listen, here's a premise. Feeling psychologically unsafe day after day skews our judgment. We suddenly give ourselves permission to do things we would just never do under other circumstances. And we justify it in order to get a little control back in our lives. It helps us feel a little safer. I want to say to you, do not be rash. And most definitely, watch what you say. Do not put things in email and do not vent to your colleague. Do not, at least not at first, protect yourself. Watch what you say. That's idea one. Here's two. Care for yourself. I am repeating the premise. Feeling psychologically unsafe skews our judgment. Our batteries get drained in a completely different way. And so we need to recharge with more intention. Care for yourself. Find comfort where you can. Now listen, a lot of people find comfort talking to other people about the situation. And I say, oh yeah, great, of course, please do. Just not with the people at work. With your friends, with your family, oh yeah, go full bore. I mean, yes, that is very comforting, isn't it? Or you might start a three-minute mindfulness practice. Or you might improve your sleep. Or you might improve your diet. Find comfort where you can. Take care of yourself. You know, I remember, <laughs> I remember talking with a client about adding mindfulness into her day. And her first reaction was resentment. She was pissed that her job had gotten her to such a pitch that she needed to add one more thing to her life. She wanted her life to be easier, and she felt her life was getting harder. But she stuck with it, bless her heart. And months later, her whole perspective shifted. Instead of being resentful about the workplace that felt unsafe... She saw it as the place that gave her the gift of mindfulness. It was a huge shift for her, and it came from dedicated self-care. Protect yourself. Take care of yourself. That is when you are living in an environment that is low in psychological safety. But what about when you are the leader? What can you do to foster and promote psychological safety? Ideas on that right after this month's gratitude. I want to start this month's gratitude by thanking the listener who asked this question. How do I get better at gratitude? That really stopped me. But I thought about it a little, and I decided that building your muscle for gratitude is really no different from building any other muscle that I talk about on the look and sound of leadership. It could be improving how you give feedback. It could be improving your one-on-one -on -one meetings. It doesn't matter what behavior you want to improve. You always, always, always have to do two things. You have to be intentional. You have to choose it. And you have to do it over and over. 
self-awareness and self-management. I, I talk about this all the time on the Look and Sound of Leadership. And really, I think the skill of building gratitude is no different. If you would actually like to practice gratitude, here is a simple little practice that many people do. Assemble three items. Number one, a year's worth of note cards. Number two, a pen you like to write with. And number three, a jar or a box to hold the cards. Find a place in your house and put them there and know that they will live there for a year. Every night before you go to bed, go to the place, write a card with one thing on it that you are grateful for that day. Put the card in the jar or the box and go to bed. It takes maybe 60 seconds. What's really interesting about this practice is two things happen at the same time. One is because you know you're going to get to dump out all the cards in a year, it keeps you coming back day after day. It's a little bit of catnip for the brain. But the other thing is you teach your brain to look for gratitude. You teach your brain, hey, at the end of the day, you have to serve me up one incident from the day about gratitude And so the brain makes it easy for itself by finding it all day long. It's a great exercise. It is, by the way, a form of self-care. For myself, I have said many times since the lockdown began in March of 2020, I have said this is a sad and distressing time in the world. I have also said that in my life I have much that I am grateful for. Both are true. I am grateful this month for people who posted reviews and comments online. Thank you so much to Eliza Eccles in the United Kingdom. Here in the United States, Caden51, Todd Thompson. Hey, Todd, nice to hear from you again. Thank you. Sharbar8, David Lanchart, and why is every nickname taken? All of those here in the U.S. Thanks, all of you, for taking the time to log on to say such supportive things. I really do appreciate it. This month's gratitude now goes to you all as a bigger group. I want to tell you something that's happened. This is the first chapter in an ongoing story that is all focused on you. I have noticed in the past, I want to say, eight weeks or so, so during the pandemic, I have noticed a surge of podcast listeners reaching out to me. Some want coaching, some want training. It is completely understandable, right? People want comfort and help, and the world is in upheaval. What I have noticed is that when podcast listeners reach out to me, it is not always easy for them to get the information they need. It's a little clunky, and I have to say, I'm sorry, and I completely understand why. When we designed our website, we designed it with our corporate clients in mind, and we did a really good job for them. The podcast audience wasn't actually on our mind at all, because in those days, I didn't really offer any services to podcast listeners. It wasn't a thing, but over the years, it has definitely become a thing, and now with the virus, it's becoming an even bigger thing. I want to make it easy for everyone, and so Essential Communications has begun a rebranding exercise. Look, I've been in business 30 years. For me to do a rebranding exercise is so exciting. So I want to say I am grateful to five people who have assembled and been willing to be my advisors. Uh, One of them I think many of you know, a master brander himself, my friend Dave Stahoviak, the host of Coaching for Leaders. Thank you, Dave, and thanks to the other four who are going to help me, give me their voices and help me build a better website for all of you. One more voice I need to hear is yours. I want to build you something useful, and you know what that is, and I do not. So here's the offer. We've put up a survey on the Essential Communications website. If you complete this short little survey, I will enter you into a random drawing to win one hour of free coaching with me. If that sounds tempting, or even if you just want to help out on the rebranding, head on over to our website. It is the Essential Communications website, essentialcom.com. It's essentialcom with two M's dot com slash survey. That's the keyword there, slash survey. It is likely that we will run a different survey next month and you can be entered again. But now, this month, some lucky listener and I are going to get to talk, and I think that sounds like a lot of fun, so thank you in advance. I am grateful.
a centralcom.com survey. One last bit, coaches, stay tuned after the sign-off. Okay, last thought about psychological safety. If you are leading a team, what would you be thinking about? Two pieces of behavior. I think they are both learnable, but I do not think they are both necessarily natural to most people. You need to choose them over and over until they become habit. The first is admitting mistakes. I think, especially when we are the boss, we get wired to think that mistakes are weakness. Mistakes make us vulnerable. We think we're getting paid to be excellent. I want to urge you to change your thinking about this. Admitting mistakes regularly as part of your natural conversation models the behavior you want. It displays awareness. It displays continuous improvement. It displays acceptance. You do not need to say the words, I'm sorry. This is not necessarily an apology. What you are doing is you are naming something that you did and simply saying it was less than excellent. That's the behavior, naming something that you say was less than excellent. I challenge you, really seriously, think of the last time you did it. When did you do it at work? When did you do it at home? I mean, right? I mean, do you do it with your kids? Do you do it with your partner? It's just not always safe to do it. That's why in order for your team to build the muscle, you as the boss have to go first. You need to model the behavior you want. Admit your mistakes. Second thing. (laughs) this is hard, invite and listen. Invite, ask people what they think and listen. Shut up. (laughs) Invite, ask people how things might improve. Listen, shut up. Don't debate their ideas with them. Don't tell them why their ideas can't happen. Thank them for their ideas. That's it. It's, you're not making a contract. You're not promising anything. You're just inviting and listening. Can you see how that would make safety? Can I give you an image? Picture this. Picture a teenage girl sitting down next to her mom and saying these words, Mom, there's something I have to tell you. (laughs) The expression that flashes across that mom's face in the next nanosecond is going to tell you a whole lot about the safety in that relationship. Is the mom bracing herself for one more disaster story from this girl? Or is the mom already opening her heart to embrace whatever has happened? When you are the boss and you invite and listen, be the second mom. Be ready to embrace what you hear and express gratitude. Doesn't that sound like safety? Listen, I've been writing about things like this for years. If you're on the receiving end of low safety, I encourage you, look at a group of tips in the archive that are about disruptive executives. Isn't that a great phrase? Disruptive executives. Put that in the search bar in the archive and you will get lots of ideas about how to work with difficult bosses. And speaking of working with difficult bosses, listen to my conversation with Dave Stahoviak on Coaching for Leaders. It was a great episode. It was called How to Handle a Boss Who's a Jerk. Coaching for Leaders, number 164. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? In our archive, I could give you 50 related episodes, but here are five that you might look at if this topic interests you. Agreeable disagreement. Assertion versus aggression. Don't take anything personally. Inviting dialogue and the coaching conversation. Good luck creating safety. It is so important these days. And next month, next month, we're going to talk about making personal connections with the people at work. Please complete the survey. Okay, that's it for me. Until next time, I am Tom Henschel. Thanks so much for listening. Hi, coaches. If you are hearing this in real time, early September 2020, I want to invite you to join me at the Executive Coaching Special Interest Group 
that is hosted by ICF Los Angeles. It's a wonderful group. We've been meeting six times a year for the past three years. We are very diverse. It's always interesting. This month, we're going to be in breakout rooms talking about the tension between staying mindful as a coach while also being in the flow of the conversation with the client. Hmm, interesting, eh? Listen, I know coaching can be lonely sometimes. This executive coaching special interest group is a great place to build community. Come join us. It's Friday, September the 11th, 9 a.m. Pacific time. It's 90 minutes. Register at icfla.org. Look for events. If you are not a member of the chapter, by the way, it'll cost you 10 bucks. But really, it's better than going out for coffee. So if you attend, please send me a note in the chat. Say hi. Tell me you're a listener. That would be so exciting for me. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye.